if Dice Tower Tonight, episode 69. So crafty. Welcome to Dice Tower Tonight, a video cast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On tonight's show, we explore the wondrous hobby convergence of crafting and board gaming. How can you elevate your games with a crochet hook and a dream? Plus, Crystal has a challenge for us. We discuss some games we've played lately, and we answer questions from the audience live. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Janice to my zoot, Crystal Pisano. All right, this one's not in my repertoire. Oh, come on. The Electric Mayhem? Oh! Okay, I do know the Electric Mayhem, but who's Zoot? I don't know. The Zoot is not familiar to me. Zoot is the saxophonist. Oh, I didn't yeah. know his name. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, I'll definitely be Janice. She's awesome. Okay, excellent. Totally. So how how are you doing, Crystal? It's It's been a couple weeks since we got to hang out, and I'm delighted to see you again. It is wonderful to see you, too. I am about the same. You know, life is weird, I think, for everybody right now. Yep. And I've kind of fallen into a new normal. And I'm still playing a lot of Animal Crossing. And I'm still working from home. So, you know, just continuing to do the same stuff. And admittedly, missing my regular board gaming quite a bit. Yes. Um, my, you know, my friend's that I play board games with, I've played with them for literally years. And so it's not just about the board games. It's they're my friends too. And not getting to see them every single week. Um, you know, at first it was like, Oh, you know, you sometimes miss a few weeks or whatever, but it's been long enough now that I'm, I, I really miss them. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, my, my normal game group is held at um, someone's house. And so it really is sort of like a, a game group dinner party every week, and uh, ever since this started, we haven't done that because it's their house. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I'm definitely missing that. I enjoy playing games with the boys, but there's only a certain subset of games I can play with them. And often when they find a game they like, they want to keep playing that game. Whereas, you know, my usual MO is to play... Uh, single games, and you know, let's or let's try this one. Let's try this one. And and my eight year old is like, yeah, I like that game. I want to play that game again. It's like, but <laughs> I have all these other games we can play. No, I want to play that game again. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's where I am. And and right now, it's it's that constant role of things I've been looking forward to getting canceled or postponed, and and having to deal with that, knowing that it's the right call, but at the same time being disappointed about it, but trying not to be too disappointed about it, because you got to remember what's important, and yeah, that's where we are. I definitely had that feel when uh, Tom announced that, you know, Dice Tower East is not happening as it normally does, which yeah. makes sense, and I'm not mad at all about that. I think it is obviously the right decision, but I am bummed because yeah. I really enjoy coming down to Florida in July every year to see yes. you all and to play games and to complain about the humidity. And enjoy I don't get to do warmth. any of that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, we all wish that the situation were different and we could we could have the event, but I think it's the right call. I had nothing directly to do with it. I, I think they made the right call, the difficult call. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to having it happen next year. And uh, hopefully we can do something later this year. We'll, we'll see. I don't know. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I know. I'm, Tom has alluded to other things that I am not privy to even. So who knows what's going to happen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and what's also happening with my kids now is, is the summer camps that are starting to make decisions. And, and we're trying to decide whether we're going to continue with those plans or not. So I might just be hanging out with these kids. For a while. I don't know. Yeah, that's where we are. But we have been able to play some fun things uh, in the last couple of weeks. Crystal, why don't you you start with one of the games you've played lately? And hello, fuzzy friend. I know. Lana's in the background drinking water again. I swear she does not drink water in this office all day until I'm streaming. And then she goes, and she's like, oh, there's a bowl of water here. I should take it out when I'm streaming, but I want her to be able to, you know, drink water. Okay, so... Um, a month ago, I let the chat vote on what they wanted me to talk about in the next episode. Indeed. And Forgotten Waters won that vote, and that's what I talked about in our last episode. Um, in case you missed that episode, friends, you should go back and watch it. Or listen to the most recent episode of Blitz. I'm going to be talking about Forgotten Waters for a while. 
This week, I'm actually talking about the game that you all voted as your number two pick a month ago, and that is Brainwaves. So there are technically three different games in the Brainwaves line right now. I have two of them. I have the Astute Goose and the Brilliant Boar. And one of them is designed by Reiner Knizia. Uh, the, the Astute Goose is Reiner Knizia. Br uh, the Brilliant Boar is Dirk Bauman. So let's talk about the Brilliant Boar first. So Brainwaves, the series, is about, they're about training your brain. They're about memory. They're not necessarily kids' games, but I think they are geared toward younger people or families. Um, and in the back of the rule books for both of these games, it talks about a scientific study that was conducted based on the three games in this series. Wow. They were testing all three games and basically they determined, and I, they don't have links to the study in here. I actually would really like to see the study, hmm. but they, um, these games are intended to help you improve your fluid intelligence, your working memory, and your long-term memory through specific mechanical elements of play, which honestly, I think that's pretty cool just to begin with. Um, the games are a little bit simplistic, but they're, it's kind of like, you know, the, the memory game that all kids play where you literally just have a grid of things and you flip one over and you flip another over. And if they match, you take them. And if they don't, you flip them back over and it's really kind of boring and whatever. This, the, the, uh, the brilliant boar is kind of like a step up from that. That's more interesting. Hmm. So the cards in the brilliant boar all have animals on them. Um, so you've got a duck or a hare or another duck. We've got a fox, lots of different animals. And you have a deck of cards with the animals on the mixed up face up on the table. And on your turn, you can do one of two things. You can draw a card or you can play a card to the table. But when you draw cards, you look at the animal that's on it and then you put it face out away from you like you would in Hanabi or Pococo. So the other players can see it and you cannot. But you got to look at it first. So you knew what it was when you put it into your hand. Then when it comes around to you again, you can either draw another card or play the card that's in front of you. When you want to play a card, it's if you think you're going to match a card that's already face up on the table. So if I, um, if someone else played this deer earlier and it didn't match something, it would just sit out on the table. If I thought I had a deer in my hand, I could then play it. And if they matched, I would get to take them. And those are points for me. If it doesn't match, it stays on the table. So if I played the mouse, for instance, and I was like, oh, I thought it was a deer. Both of these cards are now out on the table, so another player will have more opportunities to match something from their hand. You're just trying to get the cards out of your hand. You're trying to remember the order in which you put them in, just like you do in Hanabi. Unlike Hanabi, the other players aren't doing any anything with the information they have from looking at your hand. Like, it, there is no... Like, you're not combining your efforts. It's not cooperative. It's competitive, but... Other players can just see what you have in your hand and you just can't, which I think would be kind of fun for kids to be like, OK, so if a kid's struggling over which card to play, the other players can see which one's the right one. I think there might be a little bit of an element of fun there. Um, I think if you have kids who enjoy memory style games, that this one would be really neat for me personally, especially playing it solo. It wasn't very fun, <laughs> but I don't think I'm the target audience for this game specifically. Um, it's. Just when you're playing it solo, you're literally just drawing a card from the deck and drawing another card, drawing another card. And then you're like, oh, I already had a mouse. Play that down. Collect them. Um, it's 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 not ideal to play solo. But I think in a group, especially if you've got like young kids or maybe like a young kid and grandma who want to play a game together, I think this one would work. Um, then there is the Astute Goose. The other game, and this one is designed by Reiner Knizia. And I will admit, I thought I was going to have similar thoughts about this one, like kind of like, oh, it's fine, but not for me. I actually enjoyed playing the solo game of this more than I thought I would. So the Astute Goose is all about um, memorizing details on cards. So there are a... a one through six cards that get laid out on the table and there's variable uh, difficulty setups that you can do with these, but you lay them all out in some configuration. I did the hardest configuration where they're all individual. And then you below each of those cards, you put a suspect. I think that's what they're called. Um, they are all the same gentleman, but each of them has differences in his shirt, the color of his shirt 
and the animal that he has with him. All of the players have a reference card that show what all of the possibilities are in that regard. So the color, the style of shirt, and the animal. Okay. Uh, so you put out the six suspects face up, and everyone gets to study them for however long. Then you flip them all over, and you roll these two dice, and it will give you a number and a specific element. And you then, as the active player, if you roll a one and the animal symbol, have to say what the animal on suspect number one was. If you are correct, you get to keep the card. But what's neat is you look at it by yourself, and if you're wrong, the other players have a chance to steal. So if you misremembered something, other players have a chance to steal it from you. Um, I honestly, I was like, playing this solo, it's gonna be dumb, it's gonna not be that fun, whatever. And so I laid out all the cards, and I, the first six, I was like, oh yeah, this is easy, I'm golden. I was like, okay, blue shirt, yep. He had the goose, yep, good. And then as new cards came out and replaced the ones that were already there, you know, my brain started struggling a little bit. I was like, wait, that one had a dog on it, but did I already pick up the one with the dog? Is it, <laughs> is it, is it the cockatoo now? And I was actually just like sitting there and kind of like enjoying myself. And then I <laughs> paused. I was like, wait, I'm actually, this is, this is not a game that I would like clamor to bring back to the table by myself, but I enjoyed it. And so I think it would actually be more fun with a group of people for sure. Um, but it wasn't actually that bad solo. And again, for a memory style game, it's more interesting than your typical kids game fair. So of the two, I definitely prefer the astute goose. I mean, I've, I have, Reiner Knizia has designed a lot of games and I know some are good and some are not so good. I would say for a memory style game, especially one geared potentially toward kiddos, this is pretty neat. Um, Brilliant Boar, it was okay, not my fave, but um, not horrible either. And again, I don't have kids, so I can't look at it through that lens quite as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, and honestly, the artwork on these is kind of fun. I should show you all, like, like, look at the, the goose with the mask on. Like, come on, it's just... <laughs> That's it's pretty just impressive. Great. I like it. it it's fun. <laughs> There's a, a little pug on the dog card is real cute. Yeah. And and the fact they're all wearing masks is pretty cool. Yeah, right? Like, I think, yeah, I think they're supposed to be suspects in <laughs> something. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so those are the scientist recommended Brainwaves games from yep. Cosmos Games. So... I, I may have missed uh, in your description of the brilliant boar. You, mm -hmm. you can't see the cards you have. Do you get any information about the cards you have other than you, just playing something at random? The deck was face up. The cards are face up when you draw them. So you oh, look at the card okay. you're drawing into your hand. Yeah. All right. So the I deck's face that. up. So you're looking at it. You're like, oh, okay, I'm picking up a duck or whatever. And then you're putting it into your hand and you know where you put it, but you kind of, I think you could end up struggling from that same thing that happens in Hanabi where you try to organize them in a specific way. Then you right. forget how you organize them. And you're like, wait, no, did I put the mouse behind the duck or in front of the fox? And you're kind of just like confused a little bit. Um, I ended up scoring. I kept my scores. Where did I write them down? I put them somewhere. I scored uh, seven points. In the solo game for um, the astute goose and 20 points for the brilliant boar. I will say one downside, one particular downside to the solo modes of both games is there isn't like one of those scales that shows you how well you did. It just says try and beat your previous scores when you do the solo mode, and I'm that's a bummer. Like okay. I would rather have like a benchmark to shoot for, yeah. and that wasn't included. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, that's a small thing. I, I Eventually, if I played it enough, I would have my own benchmark, so. All righty. Uh, well, yeah. I, I got to play um, a game with the kids uh, that is brand new. In fact, it's not out until, I think, the middle. I saw a press release today. It should be, like, mid-June that this is coming out. The Bicycle Playing Card Company has uh, recently produced a couple of what they call light strategy games. And this is one of them. It's called The Alpha. Nice looking art there. It is a oh, yeah. wolf wolf themed game. Uh, that's an area control um, style game. The inside of the box is. Let's see if I can do this without dumping everything everywhere. Um, don't pull a honga, Eric. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, but it's got a nice, uh, you know, insert with the different player colors. Some nice solid meeples and stuff like that. You are 
running a particular tribe, a pack of wolves, and um, you have it's a nice long board. It's a it's a just a score track basically, and uh, you have a deep forest side of the board and a near forest side of the board. If I can arrange this properly, there we go. Um, and you will, based on the number of players, pull out a number of hunting grounds. So there might be bison, or there might be moose. Uh, those will be in the deep forest, because they're big and, um, you know, harder to find. Uh, but then there's there's a livestock card that's, that's usually out there. You can, um, there's a beaver and some fish. So there's, there's like small prey, and there's medium prey, caribou. There we go. Uh, and then there's big prey. And each one of them... Oh, there's also, in the bottom here, scavenge. Each one of them has a custom die. that They look kind of confusing, actually. Um, so each, each one of those different prey types have a, its own colored die that will go with that prey. So, based on the number of players, you're going to have a different assortment of these. Maybe one large and one medium and two smalls or whatever. On your turn, you will place one of your pack members onto one of those cards. You can go to the, the scavenge, which is only going to get you one food, but you're guaranteed to get it, and there's no limit for who gets it. Um, or you can go to livestock, which has a chance of getting you 12 food, but is going to uh, have a risk of you dying. This is a die result, and if you get the D, that means one of your wolves died, and they're out of the game. Oh, no. So there's that risk. Uh, but for most of them, if I went to the moose... Um, oh, and also, if I want to go to the deep forest, I have to spend a food to do so. So now I'm risking more to get to the more lucrative prey. Then it's a... Oh, you also have not only single wolves, but also a double alpha pair that's worth two. So after you're done placing all of your wolves, you then evaluate who is the leader in each of these uh, prey zones, and then you roll the dice. Uh, so this is the... here. These are the die results for the moose. And it could be worth 15 food, it could be worth 12 food, or you could get the carrion result, which means that um, the, the animal died, but you didn't get all of it, so you get like a smaller amount of food, and the next turn, it looks like that. Oh. And, you know, it sort of affects what's available next round. That's about it. Um, it, it is an interesting introduction to area control. Uh, the rules are pretty simple. I wasn't a huge fan because after all of this battling over who's going to rule, because most of the time it is uh, the leader wins, if there is a tie in who the leader is, you do one of these prisoner dilemma things where you decide to either share the the bounty or you fight. You have little... Where'd they go? Here's a little token. So you have a two-sided token, fight or share, and you'll cover that up. Anybody who is in competition for, for being the lead tribe, lead uh, pack over this, and then you reveal all at once. And if everybody shares, great. You simply split it down the middle. Um, one at a time food until the food is gone. If, however, only one player fights, they get all the food. If more than one pack fights, they hurt each other and actually get injured and they won't uh, be available. That particular wolf won't be available that next turn. And whoever is left over now gets the food. As a three-player game, three is the lowest that this can be, that doesn't really come into play much. With only three players, you're far more likely to just have a winner. Someone is going to have more characters than someone else. And if there is a tie, it's pretty obvious what move you need to make, whether you need to fight or share or, you know, someone's going to make out better if if you go one route or the other. Um, and so it just, that, that wasn't nearly as interesting. And I, I wish there were some more events or something going on. Maybe with more players, it would be a more interesting game. I think it plays up to six. Uh, so probably at four, five, or six, it's probably more interesting. At three, it was a little limited. Um, but the production is pretty solid. You you saw those pieces, nice um, wooden uh, wolf meeples. Yeah, wolf meeples. 
And uh, and the production Wolfles. is solid. No, that doesn't, doesn't work. Wolfles. <laughs> yes. Uh, and and the box is even you know linen finished box with with Ooh. shiny uh, UV coating. You can't really see it, but oh yeah. yeah. It, you can sort of see it there. The Alpha, and it's available in June. Um, a good family choice, but I think a little limited for my taste. But the kids... How, how did... Yeah, did the kids like it? Uh, my youngest did. I don't think my oldest was as interested. Um, but they enjoyed ganging up on me. So their MO was anytime I was leading in something, they'd pass me. And so I didn't lead in many areas. And I often went to the livestock and I killed, I think, two wolves that way. So I got desperate near the end. <laughs> as a wolf pack sometimes as, does as the starving wolf does and and if you if you have lost a lot like if i i would often invest to go to the deeper woods and then if that didn't pay out then i was out whatever i invested to go in there because every time you place a wolf in that deeper woods it costs you a food so yeah that's that's a little tricky um, okay i i still enjoyed it um but but it, it's a little it's a little limited for me. It'll probably stick around a little longer for the kids to play, but I'm I'm likely not going to stick it around once they lose interest. Okay. Cool. Well, Eric, um, we are going to hop into today's game, and I will admit, you know, sometimes I come up with, like, really creative and fun new games for us to play, but this week I kind of wanted to dig into an old favorite. Old favorite's uh, and good. I know I know it's one that the chat loves, so I hope they're excited. We are going to play Just One. All right. Yeah. So, uh, Eric, you are our contestant, and the chat is helping you. Uh, right. For those of you who have not played Just One with us or in general before, um, I will grab a card as an example. Um, you, all, I'm actually using real cards from the game, so you all are, are going to see a card like this on a little board. It will, the board will have a number written on it, and that will indicate which of the words you are trying to get Eric to guess. Um, so let's say the number was three and the word was apple. I would show you all the card, and then in the chat, I am going to want you all to type in a single word that you think will help Eric guess the word apple. When you type a word into the chat, make sure that it is in all caps because that is easier for me to spot and pull out of the chat. And I will take the first six responses in all caps that show up. If it's not in all caps, I'm going to ignore it. So make sure if you want your word submitted as a clue for Eric, the first six. Then of those first six words, if any of them match, they get removed and Eric doesn't get to hear them, just like in the regular game, just one. So you wanna type something unique that you think other people will not type, but that will still help Eric get to the correct word. Um, does ever, I think a lot, most of our chat has probably played this with us before, um, but hopefully you all, that's a kind of clear enough example. And Eric, for your knowledge, um, tonight, there, uh, all of the words have one thing in common. We're going to go through seven words total. Okay. They have one thing in common. All right. Um, and so you, you'll want to keep track of the ones that you do guess. And uh, we're going to start right now. So, Eric, do you have everything hidden? I, you know, it is it is oh. very difficult doing so, but I think I think I have hidden all surfaces that have you <laughs> and the chat. Yes. Yeah, so okay. I, I know. It. Yeah. When you're running the stream, it's That's... more difficult. All right. So, our first one is this: the number and the word for the chat. That is our first word. Hopefully you all saw that. And it, I know that there is a delay, so it'll take a few seconds for the chat to catch up. Um, Everyone's thinking really hard. There were a whole bunch of all caps words like before we started. Like, oh. <laughs> like, before I, like people were just typing weird things in the huh. chat and I'm not quite sure why. Okay, now real things have started coming in. That's not a valid answer. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna that we're gonna scroll back up. There we go. <laughs> so let's see. Ooh that's the same. It's technically one letter off, but it's the same. Oh. So we're two of the words are getting removed. Oh um, no. So you're only getting two clues, Eric. Okay. But I think, I think you're going to be okay. All right. Let me make sure. 
two, three, four, five, six. Yes. And those two are eliminated. Those two are eliminated. Okay. The two words that you get are Wookie and Yoda. Wookie and Yoda. Oh, that offers lots of possibilities. I mean, and all of the answers are a single word. It always It's always just one. What, just one. So Star Wars would not be a valid answer. Wookie and Yoda. What are they what what do they have in common? Um They're not both Muppets. They're not But it's gotta be something Star Wars specific. It's not just something generic like sidekick. Um Oh my goodness. This is much harder than, than I think it's supposed to be. Uh, I I have to say something. I have to say... Wookie Yoda. It's not sidekick. Um, Chewbacca. That is correct. <laughs> that was way too stressful. I don't know why someone typed Yoda. It was just like, oh, that's a one word Star Wars character. And uh, yes, the words that you did not get to hear were Han and Solo. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, good job, chat. Y'all yeah. did it. Thanks a lot, chat. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> All right. Moving on to our next word. Chat, the number and card are right here. Hopefully y'all can see that clear enough. I'm really proud of you, Eric. That was that, that was really good. I'm proud of me too. <laughs> Vanessa G in the chat said in all caps, how did he get that? <laughs> well, I think that's the only thing I could think of. Like, why would somebody have said Wookie and not Chewbacca? Yeah. And so Chewbacca must be the forbidden word. I don't know. Okay, and we've got our six, I believe the first six words are all unique, and therefore they are all going to work. Okay. They are, yes, they are all unique. We uh, Number seven was a duplicate, so luckily we didn't get down there. Your six words, your six clues are dream, movies, bowcaster, boulevard, squares, and California. <laughs> I I want to say Bowcaster is for the previous clue. Is it? I don't know what that is. So <laughs> Bowcaster is Chewie's weapon of choice. Oh, is it? <laughs> so <laughs> okay, um, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, I don't know why that was. Maybe somebody's <laughs> video is delayed. I I was like, maybe that's a thing. I don't know. Okay, one more time. The uh... okay, I'll just read the other five. Yeah, you can leave Bowcaster out. Yeah, I was like, eh, whatever. <laughs> Dream. <laughs> Movies, Boulevard, Squares, and California. It's got to be Hollywood. It is Hollywood. Yeah. All right, you in the chat are on a roll. Two for two so far. Squares is a good clue. I liked that one. <laughs> that is a good one. That was a good game show. We, You know what? We should do Dice Tower Squares at some point. We could with a proper zoom layout. If you could lock in the squares in the proper order. <gasps> Oh, I want to do that. I mean, that's a lot of people on Zoom at the same time, but that it sounds is. like fun. It is. Maybe one okay. day when we can do live shows again, we'll we'll do Hollywood yeah, Squares. Yeah, like a live Hollywood Squares. Yeah. That would be great. All right, chat, I'm showing you the next clue. The next number and clue right here. Chewbacca and Hollywood. Like, what's the connection there? Uh, Gator Dave, yes. Proper names are allowed as long as they are a single word. I really want to know what the theme is. Huh. Oh my. Okay, so that one was not in all caps. So it does not count. Oh. Uh, but well, but it would have been eliminated, and There's well, it's, that word's getting eliminated Dickler. anyway. Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those three are getting eliminated. Uh, it's a single word that was repeated three times. So you are getting three clues, Eric. Okay. Celebrate, bottle, and French. 
Celebrate bottle French champagne. You are correct. Woo! Yeah. Chewbacca doesn't drink champagne, though. Chewbacca does not drink champagne. Uh, the word that got eliminated from three repeat uh, answers was bubbly. Ah. <laughs> Alrighty, moving on to our next one. You know, it's only actually Wookiee if it comes from the Wookiee region of France. <laughs> you know, I know most people would be like, that's a dumb joke, but I really like dumb jokes, so... <laughs> that's the level we're at at this point, Crystal. We're yeah. Just... We're receptive uh, to it. I guess we, we could tell the chat that prior to the stream, you and I were talking about at some point, this will just dissolve into, de devolve into us making weird noises. Yeah, we were making weird noises and faces at each other in the five, ten minutes before the show started. Yeah. All right, and I've got the six words, and the first six are all unique. All right. Although, uh, I don't, oh, I think I know what that word is. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it properly, which I should, though, and I can't say why. Regardless, let's just do this. Okay. Uh, your words are Festivus, okay. Marriage, Christmas, Family, Party, and Mostel. Mostel. M O S T E L. <laughs> so, Festivus. Festivus marriage, Christmas, family, party, and name I can't pronounce. <laughs> huh. Festivus, marriage, Christmas, family. This is a hard one, I think. Festivus, Christmas. Oh, man. So I, I, I'm leaning towards something. Holiday, reunion, um... Reception? I don't know. Uh, I'm going to say reception. Oh, you're so close, Eric. So close. But I'm not going to tell you what the word is because okay. you, this, you will not get that one now as a clue for All you. right. I can't get them all, I guess. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. You're doing great so Thank far. You. Thank you so much. All right. I am showing the chat the next number and word. Mostel. Okay, I think I pronounced it wrong I mean, that... both times. I don't know if that was going to help me. What's funny is I actually know what it is and what it's from, and yet still don't know how to pronounce it. So, good job, me. I mean, I want to just say Jerry Stiller, but that's not... <laughs> that's not even a valid answer. And now, with, with the clues I've got, all I can think of is Chewbacca getting drunk on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> yes, like... Oh, my goodness. Okay, we've got uh, one, two, three. Oh, my, the chat just jumped. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. But two, ooh. I think technically all six words would be eliminated if I... Oh, if no! I, now, don't, if I uh, count different spellings. So I'm going to go ahead and throw in a couple, or I'm going to throw in one extra. And, or no, no, two extras. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to use, I'm going to give you one of them that is spelled a slightly differently. Okay. We're just going to make this work. It's fine. It's so fine. your words that I'm just going to give you are Anthony, Sphinx, and you know what? We'll just leave it at that. Because technically, you should have gotten nothing, and I'm going to give you two. Oh, thank you. You're Anthony welcome. and Sphinx. Uh-huh. Anthony, Sphinx. Anthony. Uh, can make it too easy. Cleopatra. You are correct. See, you didn't need more than two, Eric. Uh, yes, so in the chat, we had Anthony Asp. Caesar, Caesar, and then Antone, but I think they meant Anthony. I don't know. Uh, Is Antone? It's 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 another name. Yeah, it's another yeah, variant. So yeah, that one I was struggling with. And then Asp a couple more times, and then Sphinx, and then Egypt. Yeah, lots of people saying Asp, which I'm trying to enunciate very <laughs> clearly. <laughs> just That's in very case. Very good. I appreciate that. 
yeah, I don't, you know, family friendly show and all that. It's a snake. It's fine. <laughs> All right, putting up the next one now. Did Chewbacca date Cleopatra for a while? Is that... <laughs> I really have no I... idea what the theme is. I mean, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm gonna make you laugh basically <laughs> in a little while. Okay. <laughs> Chewbacca, Hollywood, Champagne, Cleopatra. I really, I have no idea. Maybe this is some party I wasn't invited to. Okay, we've got, I think the first six are all unique. Let me see here. One, two, three, four, five, six. They are all unique, and I believe this one will be super easy for you, Eric. Uh, okay. Not being sarcastic. Your clues are Seattle, Galactica, Grande, Melville, Latte, and Expensive. Seattle. Okay. You got Galactica, Grande, Melville, Latte, and Expensive. Starbucks. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> I don't get the Melville reference. Uh, was there a character in Moby Dick named Starbuck? Oh, I don't know. Maybe there was. I've never read Moby Dick. I, I must admit I have not either. I, I know that the first line is, call me Ishmael. That is... <laughs> All I know, and um, I really kind of know that because of the movie Matilda. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, last one, chat. Okay. Here we go, I'm holding it up now. I am still stumped on this theme, though. So, yeah, it's a tough one. They don't serve champagne at Starbucks. Uh, unless it's like, that's a special Starbucks. I promise you that all of these words have something in common. Maybe the Starbucks in Vegas serves champagne. Hollywood champagne, Cleopatra Starbucks. I'm not skipping anyone's answers, uh, chat. I am only reading the first six that come in. So you have to be quicker if you want me to read your answer. <laughs> Um, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, and they are all unique. So again, going with the first six answers that came in. Round, Storm, McQueen, Thor, Franklin, and Hopkins. <laughs> Round, Storm, McQueen, that's M-C-Q-U-E-E-N. Yep. The very famous race car, yes. Thor, Franklin, and Hopkins. So I haven't the slightest idea why Hopkins or Round applies, but I'm going to say Lightning. You are correct. And the lightning round, obviously. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, but Hopkins, I have no idea either. No clue. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. though, the chat. Oh, somebody later typed Bowcaster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love chat. Chat is awesome. Okay. So you have six words out of the seven, and they all have one thing in common, Eric. Your words are lightning, Starbucks, Cleopatra, Chewbacca, Hollywood, and Champagne. Chat, uh, I, Eric's not looking at the chat, so if you all can figure out what the thing in common is, uh, put it in the chat and uh, let me know if you know what it is. Uh, well... Maybe I misspelled everything. They're all like nine letter words. No, they're not, because Holly. Yeah, no, Hollywood is. Did I spell Chewbacca correctly? No, I did. I think I spelled champagne incorrectly, so I think that's a nine letter word as well. Is that it? Are they nine letter words? That's it. <laughs> just wanted exactly what happened to happen and I love when it does when like throughout the course of the game you're trying to make thematic connections uh-huh but I I knew Eric I knew that you're a smart cookie and you'd figure it out so 
I, you're just all, you're great tonight. I'm at least some level of cookie. Uh, no, that's, uh, that was great. Well Yay. done. Thank you, chat. Those were some well, great clues. The word that you missed, um, which was the one that had the muscle and marriage and yes. family and Christmas was tradition. So there were a lot of Fiddler on the Roof uh, yes. references, and Mostel is an... I knew that it was a character from Fiddler on the Roof, but I couldn't remember how to pronounce it. I was in Fiddler on the Roof my senior year of high school, and I recognized the name, but just didn't know how to pronounce it. It's like one of the daughters, I think. Um, That's but, Hostel. Uh, that's H-O-S-T-E-L. Uh, maybe. I don't know. That was not what got typed, but regardless, yeah. there were some Tezias and Fiddlers that popped yeah. up below the first six responses. Yes, the opening number um, of Fiddler. Some I... people in the chat uh, mentioned that the order the answers come in might look different on my screen than on theirs. Um, so in uh, case it yeah. does look like that I'm skipping your response, I promise you I am not. I'm putting. I am looking at the first six that came in in my chat. I apologize if it looks different to you all. I promise I'm always looking at the first six. Except for that Cleopatra one where I cheated and gave Eric some answers. <laughs> Gator Dave says there must be some low quality Star Wars fan fiction that ties these all together. <laughs> oh, Zero Mostel. That's what it is. Tevia, that's the actor. Zero Mostel is famous for playing Tevia. That's what it was. Oh, I totally yeah, did yeah, not yeah. know that. Okay, but it sound, I was like, it sounds like a name from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> so whatever. I didn't. Yes. No, I get that. Uh, I played Perchik uh, my junior or sophomore year. Sophomore year. Okay. In, in I did not school. have a named character. I was in the chorus. I was just, we, like, oh, the chorus was divided up into four groups. We had the mothers, the, the mamas, fathers, the papas, the daughters. The sons, yeah, yeah, yeah. The and I was a mother. Tradition, so, yeah. Yeah, I got to do the candle song and all of that stuff. And, uh, yes. yeah. That's, it, that is a very fun show to do. And great for large groups as well. Oh, definitely. We well, should we should talk musicals we've we, been in at some point. We should. We could we could be doing that for a while, yes. But yeah. we should get to our topic for the day because I think this is a fun one. We were we, you know, we always throw out ideas of what we want to talk about uh in our, our chat with, with Crystal and me and, and this one came up and Crystal's like, I like this idea. This is a good idea. Uh we wanted to talk about the the intersection between the two hobbies of board gaming and crafting. Because, uh, I mean, I think just about every board gamer has has found themselves in a Michaels or a hobby store and looked around and gone, even if they don't shop there normally, looked around and go, how can I use this in board gaming? How can I use this to organize my stuff or or make this better? Or, or this looks like a really cool game. I could replace all my Agricola pieces with these. And, and I think that's common. And I wanted to show off and talk about some of the, the fun things uh, that, that, that crafty people have made to make games better. Absolutely. And I think this is, we, we sort of joked that this is going to become a show and tell. That may be the best way to, to even start here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's just, let's just, here's the stuff that I have, uh, managed to, to find. Um, one, so my wife was into stamping for a while. She she actually sold rubber stamps and stamping supplies. And um, one of the tools that she found in this process is called a Zyron, Z-Y-R-O-N. Um, and it, it makes stickers. You can take paper products and run it through this thing and it becomes a sticker. So for the game Atta Ants, which is a, a cool, cool little abstract where you're trying to send your ants out and pick up leaves and avoid a spider. Um, she made these stickers, ant stickers, for the pieces. Because as you're moving the pieces around, you, you may be moving around many of them on your turn, um, and it was sometimes difficult for us to remember which ones we had moved already. Like, you can only move each one one time. So she made these ant stickers. They're just regular wooden discs but she made the ant stickers so that we could move them and then flip them over and now it's it improves the usability of the uh of the pieces through the Those use of cute. stickers yeah i like them i think it was just like a it's actually like a, a punch that punched them out of cardstock and then turned them into a sticker which is kind of cool um what do i have next so the game quicksilver which has zeppelins racing and a a wonderful listener 
made these and presented them to me at like Origins a few years ago. But they're like little mini Zeppelins with <gasps> terrain on the bottom that can now fly around. And each one has its own custom terrain. The purple one here, which is the one I would always want to use. Eh, come here. I don't want to break them. They're, they're a little fragile. Um, but it has like um, a building underneath. You can't really see because the camera doesn't want to uh, focus on focus. it. Focus. Um, yeah, you got to be a beauty vlogger. <laughs> yeah, I got to But anyway, that so custom pieces. I've seen um, people make out of uh, clay, like their agricola pawns, or or you know just molding and clay work and that sort of thing. Um, there was something else that I wanted to. Oh, fabric. So if you have a sewing machine, you can make. Something like this, a draw bag. And if you'll look, this is for my Merchant of Venus set. This is where all the demand tokens go, but you'll notice it's Dice Tower fabric with dice in it. Of course. So, and on the inside is Meeple fabric. Um, but you can deck out your games by getting the sewing machine out. And I also wanted to show off just because of the world we're living in right now. This is my wife's current output it's a meeple mask um, which um is pretty if cool. she takes commissions let me know because i would happily pay her to make me uh a couple of those <laughs> uh, we, we we can talk after the show okay <laughs> um and the last couple things i wanted to show off is woodworking um i i have i, I didn't bring it in here but i have a crokinole board that was made by a fantastic woodworker um I have this awesome dice tower dice tray that so, uh, Andy England actually says on the back. Handcrafted by Andy England. Um, this, now that I think about it, this could be a custom strike arena. <gasps> it could. Right? This is like, yeah. how many, I need to figure out how many dice each person needs. I could. It's what, well, six, the, right? Well, the number per player changes based on the number of players, but I can tell you how many total dice are in the game if you want. We'll talk about that after the show. And okay. the last thing is, I don't want to dump out all my Merchant of Venus pieces. This dice tower, check this thing out. Um, custom woodwork uh, and carving. I don't know how they constructed this. It's got a little flag on it and, and felt-lined baffles to send your dice in and the drawbridge actually detaches and closes if you want it to. Ooh, and it's magnetic, it and sounds like. It is. It's magnetic that attaches it on and keeps it in position. Nice. I don't even use this one. It just like sits in display in my uh, in my studio because it's too nice. I don't want to damage it. Right. That's really pretty. So all this amazing creativity that can go into and gets used to play games my kids have used that dice tray a lot to keep their dice from flying out we've been playing hero scape on the floor and that comes out and we throw the dice in the bowl that's pretty awesome well i have a woodworking thing to show off as well but i'm going to save that for last too okay um we'll start with a couple more simple things so um we said you just showed off a dice tower i'm going to show off a couple of different dice towers so um Wood, like laser etched wood is kind of a thing. Um, and there was a local board game cafe that did some like promotional dice towers out of laser etched wood. So this one is just like a little, you know, it came in all the individual pieces and I put it together. What's funny is when I was looking for pieces for this show specifically, I saw this one and I was like, oh, all these pieces come apart and are flat. And I do that thing with acrylic pouring where I pour paint. Yep. Uh, I could actually take this apart and pour paint on it. And like make a cool custom acrylic pour dice tower meeple. And I might do that. That would be um, cool. Would it still fit together when you're done? I'd worry about filling in the holes. I mean, I think I could probably use like a blade to, to scrape out the paint in the little, ed you know, the edges if I needed to. Cool. But I, uh, I think I might do that. Um, other things that people can make. And what's funny, so 3D printers have become kind of common or more common now but this was a gift that my friends gave to me it would have been back in probably around oh gosh 2013 2014 um they had a 3d printer and they made this it's a dice tower and it 
kind of goes all together like this. And then what you do is you take these parts off and they snap together to form the two sides. I'm gonna see if I can do this without breaking it. It's old. And then this part goes down in the middle. You drop dice in the top and they come out both sides. Oh, wow. It, it's pretty cool. I've got some dice here. Let's, oh, I dropped something that was on my lap. That's fine. So it's, right. uh, it's pretty neat. And then it kind of all closes up. It's This one is a little bit old and uh, coming apart a little bit because I've had it for so long. Um, but it, they just knew that I played board games. And so they whipped out their 3D printer years ago before 3D printers were even all that common and made that for me. And I thought that was really cool. Um, another thing, you showed off a dice tray. I have some dice trays as well. And these were actually made by somebody that a lot of the Dice Tower fans will be familiar with. These are little snap together felt dice trays made by Netter's Plays who yes. used to be on Board Game Breakfast. Um, so she has an Etsy store where she sells these little dice trays and they just have the little snaps that you snap together and you've got a really lightweight, nice little dice tray. And then they all, I literally just have the four of them always together. And then like, if I'm going to a game night, I will throw all four of them in a bag and just be like, Oh, if we need these, I'll pull them out. And sometimes I don't, but they're really handy and cute. Um, and yeah, I believe she's still selling them on Etsy. So you guys should look up netters on Twitter or something and get the link from her for that. The dog is barking. <laughs> I don't know what at. Just very um, excited about crafting. So all the things I've shown so far were things other people made for me. Um, this is what the one thing that I did on my own. And that is laminating. Yes. yes I yes, bought yes. a laminator just like a year or two ago because I really like roll and write games and you know what? I don't want to waste tons of paper and then run out of paper. And so I have laminated so many of my roll and write games. This is just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, I was I was weirdly scared to start laminating things. I was like, I'll screw it up, whatever. It's so easy. It could not be easier. You literally just slip yeah. the papers into the sheet, put them through the machine and cut them out and you're done. Um, I love it. And it's made it really easy to travel with my roll and gate right games too, because now I have all of the player sheets I need right here. I can put those in my quiver with some dry erase markers and the rules and the dice and boom, I've got the whole game. So yeah, that's really cool. And if you and don't then, want to invest in a laminator for yourself, if you have a teacher supply store near you, you can go and use their hot laminators uh, wow. and they charge by the foot basically. Um, and so you could just feed components into their big industrial laminators and, and get like a sheet of components. That's what I've done when I've had large things to, uh, to laminate. That's pretty cool. And then my last one is what my, probably my most prized weird upgraded component for a board game. And what's funny is it's for a game that I really don't play anymore. Have you ever played the card game Guillotine, I, I have. I believe I still have our copy sitting around somewhere. Uh, what's funny is I had to pull this off of my cell pile <laughs> to, to, to show it off because I really don't play it much anymore. It's nothing wrong with it. I don't dislike a guillotine. I just don't play it much anymore. Um, but when I was playing it frequently, one of my gripes with the game was the guillotine. It's this cardboard yeah. thing that you kind of slot, slot the thing in and it stands up and you've got a little guillotine here, right? And, it's kind okay, of flimsy. It's, it's flimsy and it doesn't look all that great. And I was playing this game with my friend James, who lives here in Vegas. He really likes board games and he really likes me. And when I was complaining about this guillotine, he said, you know, I think I can do something about that. And so he made me this. Oh my goodness. I that, have a tiny... Is that wooden, a razor blade on there? It's, it is dulled. Okay. Yes. Whoa. Oh, he knows I'm a klutz, so he immediately <laughs> told me. He was like, it is locked in place and it is dulled, so you cannot oh, hear Oh, man. Yes. Because he good. knows me really well. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's got the little like part down here. Nothing moves. There are no uh, moving parts yep. uh, on it. But it's it, for the purpose of putting it... You, now the cards get lined up in front of an actual guillotine. That's impressive. I love it so much. And 
he honestly, like, he didn't need to make this for me, but he thought it would be a fun project, and so he did. And this is also years ago, like, probably five or six years ago now. Um, it's what's funny is it has dust on it because I hadn't pulled this one off the shelf in a while. It's just been sitting <laughs> on my board game shelf. Uh, but I love it. And this is not going anywhere, even if even guillotine. Even if you sell guillotine. Yeah, this I'm keeping. And honestly, this will be a fun piece just to have without guillotine. <laughs> and people will be like, uh, what, <laughs> what is, is that? that? <laughs> Why is there a tiny guillotine? Why not? Um, but it was a really neat gift for my friend to give me and make for me. And yeah, I, I really like it. And this is the kind of thing that like, I think takes the board gaming experience just to that next level because it's, it adds that fun moment of like surprise and delight that like maybe a game like <laughs> that a guillotine, guillotine would go. Yeah. Wouldn't, <laughs> I mean, well, I don't know what the delight, definitely surprise. <laughs> Surprise guillotine! <laughs> Surprise guillotine for everyone. Oh my goodness. Um, but yeah, I, I have some other, like I have um, some cases that I bought at Michael's, like the photo cases. Yep. And yep, yep. I have some Plano boxes as inserts that I've uh, started using. The one I have in my Quacks of Quedlinburg box is my favorite. I have all of those custom tokens sorted out into a Plano box and I love it. Um, but I think... The games that I truly love and want to play a lot, I really enjoy kind of giving them these little special touches. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Especially if it's one that's coming out, you know, a lot or bringing to conventions. That's one that it's really cool to bring out the custom components. Um, yeah, I, I love being able to make your game just a little more flashy. And, yeah. And, and, and then, you know, allowing other hobbies to intersect as well, which is cool. For sure. Um, Jay in the chat asked, which Plano box is best for quacks? I bought one off of Amazon. Uh, if you want, if you, if you're on Twitter, uh, tweet me later and I will try and find the link to the one that I purchased and used and I will uh, share it on Twitter. Yeah. I can't go find that right now. <laughs> I just switched over my, my copy of quacks to a Plano box as well. And, um, I, I don't have the number handy. Yeah, it, but I, all I remember is it was on Amazon and it was like pretty cheap. It was really inexpensive. Like custom inserts for games tend to sometimes be a little bit pricey. The Plano box I got was easily, I mean, less than $10. Like it was nice and cheap. Oh yeah, so. I, I, in fact, I got a four pack and, and it was even less expensive. <laughs> Jay in the chat asked if Sterling is my husband. No, Sterling <laughs> is my Maltese. <laughs> uh, and he is just barking for the sake of barking right now apparently <laughs> well we we do have a few more minutes that we we can hang out and answer any questions that you may have in the chat i did see one um as as people are talking uh i forget who asked but um i mentioned on the dice tower podcast that uh i've been playing a game on tabletop simulator called the legend of zelda clockwork kingdom it is a Zelda-themed, fan-made adventure game uh, where you cooperatively dungeon delve uh, and explore tiles and try and get items and get weapons and, and treasures and stuff to take on the boss of each dungeon, eventually working your way up to Ganon as the final dungeon that you, you tackle. And they were asking if I'm still playing it. I am. I'm playing it with my brother out in L.A., we have sort of a weekly meetup where we'll, we'll get together and play. Um, we have not yet finished the scenario. It's taken, you know, when you're, you're doing the online games, sometimes it takes a little longer than it would normally because you're sort of wrestling with the interface. And, you know, this particular game has you exploring tiles and then manipulating them. So you might activate a, a machine that twists these five tiles in a particular way, which is very cool mechanically. In Tabletop Simulator, it's a little clunky. You got to pick it up and rotate it, and then you, you miss, you overshoot by, like, you know, a degree, and so you got to get it to go back and then sit back on the board. Um, so it's taken us longer than it normally would to play through the game. I still like it. I think it's an interesting puzzle and, and a fun deck-building adventure. Plus, the theme is really cool, and it's a shame that it'll never see any sort of commercial distribution because it's a fan project that Nintendo would drive into the ground if it was being sold. But it is free on Board Game Geek if you want to check it out. Legend of Zelda Clockwork Kingdom. 
That's really neat. I will admit, I usually try and listen to your all's episode of the podcast before we do Dice Tower tonight. So like I'm up on what you've been playing. I have my podcast listening. I always listen to podcasts on my commute and I don't commute anymore. So, and I can't listen to podcasts while I'm working because I'm a writer and I can't write and listen to words at the same time. So I have missed so many podcasts in the past two months and I feel really bad. I'm very behind. I believe my current backlog is 140 episodes of various podcasts. I have like a, a just a playlist of all the, the old stuff, you know, every episode and it's just chronologically lined up. Um, my big issue, one, um, I, I'm not taking as many walks i'm not driving around as much um it's just I, I don't have as many opportunities to the only time i get to listen to podcasts is like when i'm making breakfast or dinner and that's about it um plus for whatever reason a lot of the podcasts i've been listening to are not appropriate for my kids to listen to see even mm. even like this american life can sometimes get into uh, subject matter or, or language that I don't necessarily want to have them listening to in the other room. And so um, I have to keep skipping over things. And, and we've listened to a lot of board game blitz because you guys don't do that. But um, <laughs> other, other, other shows have not had that fate. And so I've, I've had to, um, you know, delay my listening on that one. Well, I will say I don't usually plug blitz here because i don't need to it's whatever but our next episode eric is our fourth anniversary episode oh, boy you were you were talking about stuff you've got planned i am so excited so the episode itself is going to be great um we're actually still looking for um submissions from people who listen to the podcast if you do listen to board game blitz and you want to submit an audio clip and be featured on our anniversary episode you can do that um just email us boardgameblitz at gmail.com you can literally record something on your like phone recorder on your iphone or whatever it doesn't have to be fancy or anything like that um if you like the show or just like to wish us a happy anniversary or whatever we're looking for clips and we want to feature you all but in addition to the episode, Ambie and I are going to be releasing something else, a project that we've been working on. I actually came up with the idea for this project, like, I want to say like two years ago. And then we kind of just sat on it for a while and it's, it's finally happening. And I, Eric, I cannot tell you how excited I am for people to see what we've been working on. It's one of the greatest things I've probably ever created in board game content. <laughs> if you are that excited about it, I am also excited and want to see it. Yeah, like, Ambie even, like, just messaged me out of the blue while she was working on it, and she was like, this is going to be so good. <laughs> so, and Ambie's not the, like, I'm the type that's always, like, you know, excited and yes. crazy about stuff, and even Ambie's am. That's so. awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Um, do do we have any other questions in the chat? Oh, boy. Um, who has time for podcasts? Well, not me, apparently. So let's see. Do you uh, think there's going to be like a huge flood of games released when this is all over? Since designers have been able to focus on designing, um, we sort of have this backlog that's building up production-wise, too, I think. Um, as releases have slowed down, publishers are not quite as, as willing to, you know, release big things when it's harder to shop for games. There are no conventions to release them at. Um, so I think we keep seeing these delays. There's going to be this glut of releases when we're finally able to get together and, and actually start doing this thing again. I think it'll be interesting. I think there will be probably a larger amount of releases that happen around the same time. But I, and it, I think it's going to be a struggle for publishers because what do you do? Like, do you release at the same time as a bunch of other games and hope that your game breaks through the noise? Or do you wait when you've already, you haven't been bringing in the income you normally would and waiting longer might be problematic too? Um, I think that board game publishers are in a really tough spot right now, and I really hope that they are able to figure out ways to make things work. Um, I do think that even without conventions, there are ways for publishers to get their games out 
through online channels, you know, assuming production is able to happen. Um, I've seen some people doing like demos of games on online platforms and things like yes. that. And I, I think that's a smart route. Like you can still show people your games. It's just a little bit different and a little harder. Yep. Um, but I don't envy anyone working formally in the board game industry right now. It's, no. it's going to be a tough year. Uh, we are, I mean, we're, we're about to see the first of the online conventions uh, start showing up. I know Origins is doing online events when they would have been doing their in-person events. And, and the idea being that there will be, you know, panels and demos of new games. And it, it will be interesting to see how that works um, and how well they can cycle through people to, to demo their games and show them off. Uh, everyone is trying very hard to to market and interact with with the players out there um, while this is while you can't be in pl close proximity. Sorry, I know my typing is loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I now I'm I'm just trying to dash back and forth and and look at some of the backlog in the chat. Uh, someone asked what my biggest non board gaming interest was. I think I think it's got to be film music. I I am a big film music nerd. Uh, back when I was on Beethoven.com, I hosted a segment called Film at 11, and I was very big on um, uh, on presenting new soundtracks and uh, and music from movies. I also love novelty music, comedy music. Um, that that may be the the closest. Uh, passion to uh, if, if you're going to to knock board gaming out for me. How about uh, I've, you, Chris? I've actually, um, well, kind of piggybacking off of that, I have actually found that if you want background music for when you're playing board games, uh, film scores tend to be really great for that. Like, I'll just go to Pandora and type in like Alan Silvestri or, you know, someone else kind of composes big epic film scores. And that tends to be great background music. Uh, Lana just came into my office. She's sitting by my chair and smiling up at me and wanting me to pet her. So that's happening. Good. Um, I don't know what the, the, the dogs are going a little bit bananas in quarantine too. I think, I think they're happy that we're here all the time and also confused. Like what, what you don't leave anymore. <laughs> um, for me, my biggest interest outside of board gaming, I mean, I do play video games, but I kind of consider those things tangentially related. Like gaming for me is kind of a thing and always has been. Um, I do, as I mentioned earlier, I do a little bit of art, like the acrylic pouring, although admittedly I haven't done that in um, a couple of months. I haven't, you'd think being quarantined, I would do more of that, but I haven't been doing that recently. I kind of want to get back to it. Um, other than that, I really love watching TV. Like, <laughs> that sounds generic, but like, <clears throat> I think especially since around 2008, um, TV shows have been elevated to a new, like, level of art. Um, I think movies used to be the thing. And now I think truly TV shows have surpassed movies in a lot of ways. Um, and I really love, she's drinking water again, I, whatever. <laughs> People in the, I just don't want people hearing that noise and being like, what the heck is that? <laughs> it's the dog. Um, like, there have been so many good TV shows, like, awesome TV shows. I am currently uh, watching Schitt's Creek for the first time, and multiple people had recommended it to me. And, like, literally, like, one of my former coworkers, like, grabbed me by the shoulders and, like, shook me. And he was like, Crystal, you will love this show. You have to watch it. And I was like, I know, I know. It's on my list, I promise. And this was like a year or two ago now. Yep. And I'm finally watching it. And now I totally understand why he was shaking me because it's so perfect for me. And I love it so much. It's delightful. Uh, what do we think about Chaz and Rodney Smith teaming up on Watch It Played? Sounds great. Those two guys are wonderful. Uh, Chaz is one of the most creative and hardworking people in this hobby media space. I adore him. He is so cool. And so the two of them working together is great. 
Uh, yeah, they are both super nice and they both make really, really great content. So I am excited to see what they're going to do together. Um, and Matthew Jude and Paula Deming are also kind of doing stuff with them as well. So that's really exciting. Um, I like all of those people a lot. Uh, I, I am just excited to see content creators working with each other. And not to say that they never have, like a lot of content creators make stuff with other people, but I like seeing people working together. Um, I think one of the cool things that will come out of the state of the world right now is we're kind of all being forced to do more things digitally through the internet. And I think that's going to show not just board game content creators, but the world at large, what cool things can happen even if you and somebody else aren't in the same room. Um, and I think working together collaboratively across vast distances, people are going to realize that it's not as difficult as it may have seemed before. Um, and I hope that more new collaborations and creative projects come out of that. Um, and I hope that more content creators, like more people that have never made content before will maybe take a shot at it too. Like, I just want to see more people making more stuff and I want to see different stuff and I want to see new stuff and I'm always excited. Um, and I just love that, you know, at least on the content side, board games are, you know, we're still going full steam ahead all over the place. Uh, the only other thing I saw go by was, do I think there will be a reprint of Merchant of Venus? Uh, I have heard nothing. It would be great if that came back, but there were so many issues with the most recent reprint, with legal issues. Um, I I don't expect it to happen anytime soon. Um, it would be great. Go ahead and bug Fantasy Flight Games, but I don't really get to talk to them much anymore. Um, uh, once they became Asmodee North America, it became a little harder to, to break that shell, and Fantasy Flight was always a little tight-lipped about their releases. Um... I have heard nothing, but I don't really hear anything from Fantasy Flight these days. Um, and I missed one question earlier. I don't remember who asked it. Someone asked when I was going to be doing another live stream of yes. uh, gameplay. And I don't know is the answer to that question. But I wanted to say, um, if you all have a game that you would like to see me play live on the channel here, um, please send me an email and let me know what that is. Um, and it could be a new hot game like Forgotten Waters, or it could be an old game like Mall Madness or the Omega Virus or the McDonald's game. Like I own a lot of older yep. uh, games. Honestly, uh, I, I would love to play Atmosphere <laughs> on stream, but I can't really play that one solo. <laughs> so, and I think from a distance that one might be difficult. Um, What's funny, uh, we talked about Matthew Jude earlier. He actually picked up a copy of a like a sequel to Atmosphere that came out later. Uh, I think it's called Khufu's Revenge or something like that. It yes. has Khufu in the title. Um, and it's impossible to get in the States. But across the pond, it's in thrift stores like, whoa. So he grabbed a copy of it for me, and it exists. My copy is over in England, and at some point, I will have that. And I really All want right. It. So now you're oh, really that. you're really going gunning for a convention where you can get Matthew Chu to come over. Right? Like, I he got this for me, like, sometime last year, and we haven't connected. So I want to get that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I guess it, time <clears throat> flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? It really does. This uh, has been a lot of fun. I always enjoy spending time with you, Eric, and the chat. It's Chat did a great job playing our game today. Thank you for the great clues. Uh, I, I couldn't have done it without you. And, uh, and Crystal, it's always wonderful to spend time with you. And, and good to see you're doing well and hanging in there. For sure. Yeah. Well, um, we will be back again in two weeks, which will be almost the end of May, which seems bananas to me, but that'll be May 27th, what? 6 p.m. Pacific, I know, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, before you all leave today, if you could do me one tiny favor and just click the little thumbs up button below the video. We have four thumbs downs, but guess what? That still helps the algorithms. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you'd like, please just click the thumbs up button because it, it makes my uh, self-esteem feel better. <laughs> Uh, we will see you in two weeks, but until then, I am Crystal Pisano. I am Eric Summerer. And you have been watching Dice Tower Tonight.
Thank you for watching. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. Crystal and I will see you in two weeks for another installment. Our show is supported by viewers like you. Thank you. Dice Tower Tonight is produced by Crystal and me, with assistance from Tom Vassell, Mike Delisio, Roy Kennedy, and Rob Searing. Our international paring knife convention brought to you by the Peelers of the Earth. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. <laughs> Give us your feedback on the Dice Tower Guild at Board Game Geek on Facebook or Twitter, or by emailing us at crystal at dicetower.com or eric at dicetower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network. Find something new at dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all of us at the Dice Tower, have, have fun, fun gaming. gaming. We got a lot of thumbs ups and we got one additional thumbs, thumbs down. down. Someone watched the whole episode and then was like, you know what? Nah, this isn't for me. You, you told them that it all helped anyway. It's a... ah, whatever. Bye, everybody. Bye.